senior archaeologist with uh, Museum of London Archaeology, MOLA. And I met Jim now a while ago <laughs> at uh, World Archaeological Congress in Dublin, that same place that I met Colleen for the first time. So it was a wonderful, uh, a wonderful uh, forum. And as we were talking about earlier, when I first met Jim, he was um, working at the intersections of art and archaeology and heritage and geography and a lot of a lot of uh, different fields and it was incredibly exciting uh, his project work on his PhD uh, then and it's great to see that that's carried on. <laughs> He's going to talk to us today about some fascinating connections between buildings and flowcharts uh, and the way we think about uh, I guess the representation and moving through and thinking about different types of spaces. Uh, and I think it also connects to some of the other work that he's doing, which he may or may not mention around public archaeology, public engagement, uh, and the nature of people's understandings of the historic uh, record. So uh, he's always doing the most incredible things. I hope that uh, you'll follow him after the fact. I'm really excited to turn it over to Jim to tell us more. Thank Great. you. Thanks very much. He's always doing the most incredible things. I should. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I've got all my business cards. It sounds. So <laughs> um, yeah. So I work for MOLA in London. Um, I work for them primarily as a, a buildings archaeologist. But because I work for them in their planning section, um, that means that although I work with all sorts of different types of historic building, um, I'm always very much working with them in the contemporary built environment and always thinking about how they relate to a number of different potential futures. Um, that sort of will become evident as I keep going, um, that I'm very much talking about the present day when I talk about buildings. It, it, it's an aspiration that these, um, some of the ideas I'm presenting can be applied to more historic buildings. Um, we'll see. Uh, this talk is, is going to concern all buildings, hopefully. How they relate to the future at particular moments in their lifespans, and what that means as buildings age and move through time. A building is a lot of different things. Firstly, it is an object a structure created to fulfill a particular purpose. Secondly, it's the life, human and non-human, in and around that structure. Any building is most meaningfully thought of as the complete accretion of things, people, and thoughts and more that occurs in relation to that physical structure. It would be a fallacy, though, to reduce what a building is to the things that happen in and around it. The structure is definitely important. It would be equally fallacious, however, to give primacy to the physical structure, as no building is intended to be a pure object. This paper um, arises from within buildings archaeology and its relationship to built heritage. It's prompted in part by an awareness of the limitations of the field as practiced commercially. In the UK, all guidance on the production of high standard buildings archaeology reports are focused on the recording of the structure as intended by its architect and alterations to that original building between its existence and abandonment or other points of major change to its form. With relatively few exceptions, a formal archaeological standing building report, at least in the commercial uh, sector, records that structure with reference to the architectural context surrounding its creation. There are obvious reasons for a primary focus on the idea of an original form not least that the structure itself is often the most immediately precarious thing by the time archaeologists come to be involved in a site. Um, also, that commercial budgets very rarely allow archaeologists to expand beyond minimum standards outlined by various organisations. Whatever the reasons for that current situation, however, we are left with a field in which a great many of the contexts and perspectives that contribute meaningfully to what a building is are routinely factored out of analysis. Thinking about why this might be and how to change the situation is hopefully really useful for practical archaeology, for theoretical archaeology, and for working with contemporary buildings and heritage. 
but this um, talk is called <coughs> Do Buildings Flow? Um, and it's going to start, at least, with flowcharts. Um, flowcharts are a potentially dull enough subject, but they're one that I've found over the last year or so to be a very fruitful, interesting way of thinking about um, some different things about buildings, certainly contemporary buildings and buildings from the recent past, but hopefully with wider potential application. To explain where I'm coming from, I want to draw a distinction between two slightly different um, but similar questions. The first is, do flowcharts help us understand buildings? If I was going to answer that question, um, which you may, may have already guessed I'm not, <laughs> I might take you through the practical use of flowcharts in buildings archaeology, how we could put them together, how they aid archaeological and historical interpretation of buildings and built landscapes. I can see some use in going down that route, uh, but it might be a little dull. A very um, early version of this PowerPoint, first nine or ten slides were different kinds of flowchart. <laughs> <laughs> Scrapped it. You're, you'll be very glad to hear. Um, but also, trying to say that flowcharts particularly help us understand buildings uh, might be slightly dubious, theoretically, it's a bit regressive. Um, it's enormously open to critique. It's also a bit easy, um, and I like, like my archaeology a bit messier, really. So the question I've been working with recently is not whether flowcharts are useful, but how does thinking about flowcharts help us think about buildings? Because when you start thinking about flowcharts, it immediately opens up and starts to question a whole range of assumptions about what's being shown. Things being taken for granted, things being ignored, things being assumed. In short, that idea of two boxes with an arrow between them is highly contentious. However, it's my belief that having a go at seeing what works and what doesn't in visualising a building as a flowchart opens itself for similar critique and that this is something we can learn an awful lot from engaging with. Uh, my thinking in this area began... about construct sites, um, some bits of which I'll read some later. I sketched out a little flowchart that showed the linear process of a building being imagined, taken through the contemporary planning system, occupied, deoccupied, and ceasing to exist. Not entirely seriously, I assure you, I used an online graphics program to draw out that chart, and this is it from a year ago. Um, now I'll emphasize again that I'm using this as a note, something to keep in front of me as I wrote my paper. It's most definitely a note, not something I particularly believe to be um, <coughs> accurate, certainly not exhaustive of, of anything. At this point of that paper, I was making two related points that the flowchart was helping me with. Firstly, that while a building's being built, It's not little. Um, there is such a thing, therefore, as a non-complete building that has a different kind of existence to a complete one. Secondly, that if we do this kind of process idea of a building, different disciplines approach that process at different points and have different perspectives on it. And if I put some arrows on, you can see roughly the mid that red arrow pointing down towards the present from the past. That, that may be a sort of typical art historical um, approach to buildings and architecture. And this one here that starts with demolition or an occupation and looks back, that might roughly be a commercial archaeological uh, perspective. So it's sort of useful enough and certainly helping me to make the points I wanted to make. Um, but then I made what felt like a huge mistake at the time and posted that flowchart on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> thinking that people would find it amusingly complicated and that I would get a few cheap likes. Um, instead, I ended up with a two day long discussion with a few different people that made me wish I'd never drawn the thing in the first place. <laughs> the discussion focused on two main aspects of the process of a building. The first is the idea of completion and non-completion. Um, in the flowchart here, you, you see a progression from planning construction and then a split to either completion or non-completion. People had a lot to say about that. 
uh, mostly that, 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 that there's no such thing as a complete building. Um, I agree with that and I don't, and I'll come to that later. Uh, but generally, um, everything that happened after posting this on Facebook was entirely frustrating. Um, but after a bit of time, a bit of space, a bit of recovery, um, it started to make me, in a slightly more um, useful way, question the kind of assumptions that I had made in even sketching this out in the first place, um, beyond even putting it online. Um, but it's also, in advance of today, made me keep um, thinking and experimenting um, with what this might mean in a few different ways. Um, and that's uh, the point we're at right now. So we um, might imagine that a building begins its existence as a potential solution to a particular problem, whether or not this is realized and put into words and images by humans. At some point, the building will be conceived as a potential form. Thereafter, a building will be designed and one or, uh, and sorry, a building or a number of alternative buildings will be designed and one or more of these designs will be adopted as a potential building. This design will become a planning application which may receive permission to be built. Thereafter, construction will begin. At some point, it will end. If the construction process ends satisfactorily, the building has reached what is probably the most widely recognized form, the built building. These are the ones that you see around you and that you call buildings. It will then be occupied, altered, occupied and altered again and again by multiple formal and informal tenants and finally become <coughs> disused, demolished, forgotten and last of all, theoretically, post-existent, as not even archaeologists or archivists can suspect it was ever there. Um, in a way, that seems like it should be obvious and self-evident, but there are loads of problems with just saying that, which just describes that, um, that flowchart. There are problems about the certainty of how things happen. There are problems with linearity. Um, there are certainly problems with the nature of what's in the boxes. When you draw a box around a word, it does things. Um, and there are problems with the amount of things missing from there. Um, and that was kind of my, my start point in preparing for today. So I went back to this really, really, really simple flowchart. Um, <laughs> so this looks like a really simple flowchart, but there's an awful lot going on. Um, we've got three boxes. We've got two arrows. We've got words in the boxes. Um, we, we've got the fact that it runs from left to right in a straight line. Um, but it does contain some things that I hope we can agree on in, in lots of cases. Um, there being no building, move to there being a building. And in lots of cases, a building will ultimately result in no building. That happens quite a lot. But you can see that this is incredibly um, simple. But of course, one thing that is always there, with that move from no building to building, one thing that's always a possibility is for no building to result in no building. There is always potential for nothing to happen rather than something. Even just with that one difference, um, we've, we've made quite a big difference to the flowcharts. Not only are there extra boxes and extra words, but we've got this bit. We've got this line that forks and goes in two different places instead of one. Didn't need to point at it, thank you. <laughs> um, because there's a line that goes two ways, it means that something has happened an event with two possible outcomes. One of these things will happen in the world or will have happened, and one will not. But at this point, we don't know which one of those things will happen, and they are both possible. A lot of different things can happen between those two theoretical points in time, building and, building and no building. Um, these encompass a complex set of interrelated pasts, presents, futures, tangible and intangible expressions of what a building is. Rather than a thing, then, a building is a process, a series of creative enterprises of different physical forms, each of which is independently worthy of consideration within the broad fields of building. Back to the original one, you can see the, 
difference there. They're not that different. What we should remember here um, is that this process of moving from being a potential future solution to some problem to not existing anymore um, involves a series of stages that are more or less codified, either through disciplinary tradition and practice or through being written into legislation and policy. It's not purely theoretical. Um, and there are some things that we can say about these codified processes. Um, they are, in general, things that happen in time. Um, they always have positive results, by which I don't mean good or bad, I mean that they have um, observable outcomes. Sometimes they arise within different disciplines. I'm thinking of maybe um, archaeological recording as mitigation, for instance, is a is a technical process that does something to a building. Um, they arise from other kinds of technical process like design, but they're often also enshrined in legislation, such as the planning process. By understanding these different set stages, we can move on from a general appreciation of a building as an ongoing process to one in which that ongoing, messy, complicated set of things that we saw in the big flow chart is nevertheless punctuated by points at which a building is popularly or legally recognized to be a particular thing, despite the likelihood that this will never be the whole story. Um, here's another example. Um, this is another very, very simple flowchart, but one that shows the creation of a number of different physical and more ephemeral things, but through these different codified processes. So for instance, in the easy flowchart, we go from concept to design, but a concept may never result in a design, which means you've just got a concept floating in someone's head, maybe some notes on a piece of paper. But it does exist as an unbuilt building. Likewise, moving from design to planning application, um, that process may involve getting rid of lots of different designs, in which case you have more, more unbuilt buildings. Planning applications can be refused. Permitted developments can end up not being built. And throughout this whole um, seemingly simple process, you have all sorts of different complicated things happening that um, can be partly physical, um, partly ephemeral. But this shows also that one simple linear vis visualization in the blue that series of codified technical and legal processes um, all still has more than one outcome. Uh, so I'm going to give a couple of um, case studies that will show some of this in action um, and what happens in between some of these boxes. The first is that I'm going to talk a bit about how a planning application becomes a permitted development, which uh, just hearing that come out of my mouth, it sounds deadly dull, I'm sorry. Um, it will involve at least one picture. <laughs> and then, to capitalise on that excitement, I'm going to talk about how a, how a permitted development becomes a building. Uh, and that will be awesome as well. Um, what we're going to do with these case studies, there's a few different things. Um, really, I'm exploring the nature of arrow between boxes on a flowchart, questioning the ease and certainty with which we can move from one box to another. We're going to be adding multivocality into analysis and using it to introduce notions of precarity to counter the certainty suggested by the idea of a flowchart. And I'll be ending with the suggestion that precarity is a very important thing for understanding buildings of all periods in how we turn buildings into heritage and how we as archaeologists can do better by our fellow citizens today and in the past and future. So this is Lakota. Anyone from Bristol? No. If you're from Bristol, uh, certainly if you're from Bristol and about 50, you would um, remember going to Lakota in the 80s. Um, this is a nightclub just off, for those of you who know Rachel Kiddy's work, just off Stokes Croft. Stokes Croft is the street at the back where the van is there. Um, when I was doing my PhD, 
uh, a planning application went in to demolish that building. Oh, sorry, there's Stokescroft. This is the Stokescroft conservation area. That's that's where Rachel Kitty did her, her work on that corner up there and the coaches there. So, very, very close by. Um, so, th there was a planning application went in um, to demolish that club and to replace it with a mixed use development with residential above, some pre creative spaces on the ground floor and um, I think parking below. There were two hearings, April 23rd and June the 11th, over the course of which 28 different individuals made representations to the um, council planning committee. And here's one of them at the bottom, um, not actually from the committee uh, at stuff, from an interview with me, but um, it, it is representative. Why should I, just a normal person, preserve something and it cost me money? That doesn't make sense, does it? It doesn't make sense. If they want to preserve it, they can buy it and they can do what they want with it. I'm really not that bothered. It's all Bristol's history. Bristol's history, as far as I'm concerned, is tainted in my ancestors' blood. So me wanting to preserve it, I don't give a monkeys. These now are taken from the um, printed minutes of the meeting. Um, we counter that that quite emotive um, first idea of what that building is about with the Kingsdown Conservation Group. It's a building of considerable local interest, um, built 1850, one of the few reminders of a long phase of industrial activity, and so on and so on. We then also have two contrasting views from local residents. Um, one, um, Bristol is both nationally and internationally famous for its unique music culture. Um, very much emphasising the building's connection to a, a different sort of cultural history than the Kingsdown Conservation Group. Then another local resident who says the building is, is an eyesore, does nothing to contradict people's opinion of St Paul's as a rundown area, and I'd quite like to be able to afford a flat and I can't, which is a, a very real problem. In this case, the case of Lakota, we see a clash of different ownerships. On the one hand, we see a, a sort of moral ownership of the site asserted by Kingsdown Conservation Group, who want to preserve an historic industrial building as a civic community. We see a level of cultural group ownership asserted by the Keep the Clubs spokesman, um, who wants the building's history and the local music scene recognised and preserved. The more theoretical, these more theoretical ownerships, the sort that we interpret and impose quite easily in our archaeological analyses of places and spaces, must, however, be juxtaposed with the building's literal financial and legal ownership by a woman who believes the history of Bristol is tainted with the blood of her ancestors. Further, what we see in comparing these narratives is the opposition between destruction and creation as positive and negative acts. For one group, demolition is a loss. For others, demolition is a gain. People writing about or talking about material is as much a concern of archaeologists as the material itself. This point is made especially clear by the Lakota meetings. If a case such as this is an integral part of urban regeneration, and such meetings happen almost every day somewhere, understanding how a planning meeting works is essential for analysis of the urban environment. The duration of the consultancy, even of the meeting itself, is a definable unit of analysis, central to the discussion of the site or building. Material always has multiple narratives woven around it, however basic. What we see in a planning meeting because a legal decision is made at the end of it, is the moment at which one narrative is allowed to develop in the future and others not, at least not in relation to the material in question in the built environment. So with Lakota in 2008, the planning committee ultimately decided in favor of the application to demolish the building and replace it with a new mixed use development Certain narratives of that building were allowed to retain physical presence in the landscape, others were denied. The punchline is that the development never went ahead. <laughs> but if we think of back to that arrow um, between planning application and permitted development, what is it? Does does that flow? Is there a flow there? Well. It does, because these things happen in order. But firstly, we've got 
the planning meeting contained within there. We've got multiple overlapping competing narratives. We've got the moment in April of having no decision and requiring further information. We have another planning meeting. We have a decision that both enables and disables. By only having one arrow, what are we choosing to ignore or exclude? I think this is really quite important for archaeological interpretation. Um, what we tend to see is what has become enabled in different ways. And in some circumstances, it's very, very useful to go beyond that. This is my current favourite subject, half-built buildings. Um, half-built buildings are a really interesting thing that we don't think much about. They are um, everywhere. Um, and every building used to be a half-built building. So understanding half-built buildings is potentially quite important for understanding building buildings, I think. Um, this particular picture is from a current development happening um, happening just northwest of Cambridge called the Northwest Cambridge Development. Uh, it's, it's a huge site uh, that's um, it's essentially building a new small town on the edge of Cambridge. Um, that you may or may not have friends or colleagues wanting to move there. I've been involved in a project there. Um, last November, we went up and did um, our year one survey, year one of 25, <laughs> where we're going to keep going back and um, follow this site from not existing. The year before this, we, we did a kind of year zero when we went and looked at the archaeology. The, the site huts of the archaeologists and the um, and the people making the roads for the development, um, where we're going to look at what happens from nothing to potentially a second generation of people moving into the site. Um, what's really interesting about this case, um, the developer is consciously very environmentally friendly and states that all material leaving the site is accounted for. Indeed, as much as possible is recycled on site, whether this is the moving around of soil for landscaping, the reuse of unwanted trees, for instance, in the construction of the children's playground. However, question this, and a different story emerges. We see, for instance, that personal waste leaving the site is dealt with by a national waste contractor, and the Cambridge developers don't know exactly where it ends up, immediately connecting the unfinished site to national and international networks of waste disposal in a way that's not part of the official narrative. At a micro level, we see tiny amounts of soil and other organic material traveling from Cambridge to Yorkshire every Friday as the special, specialist piling workers return home for the weekend. Lastly, although there are official uses for the large and medium pieces of wood, smaller pieces are sold to passers-by as firewood. It's a simple example but enough to see that the processes of construction create their own material networks that aren't necessarily known to the people active in the construction itself, but that are also unacknowledged as part of the official narrative of the site's creation, either before or after the fact. As Bill Rathjay concluded long ago in his pioneering studies of modern material culture, there is usually a difference between what people say they do and what their refuse tells us they actually do. Here we see that discrepancy in action. Returning to half-built buildings, the investigation of an active building site gives a clear example of how a single development with attendant marketing literature and company policies relating to environmentally sustainable construction can be seen to be somewhat different in practice, albeit at a relatively microscopic level. I think when the holes you're picking are soiled on, on people's boots, I, I think ultimately they're probably doing okay. Before construction has begun, we have only intention. When the development is completed, and as we move ever further from the construction phase, that intention becomes a fixed narrative of past action, as marketing literature, often produced in advance, becomes documentary evidence. Only the investigation of the site being made reveals the alternative story, the uncertainty as to the material network being enacted. Yeah, so um, one potential alternative story, as I mentioned before, uh, is for that half-built building to 
never be finished. It's lack of certainty, as I've said, um, ties together all buildings of all periods in all places. Um, so, so that should be there in the chart somewhere, or perhaps in any interpretation. Um, and that kind of brings me to this thing called the spectre of non-completion that I've been working on, and that at some point um, I've got a book chapter coming out uh, on it. The spectre of non-completion, um, if I could sum it up in a sentence, would be that every building that's ever been built has at some point had the potential to not be built. And if you factor that level of precarity into the built environment historically, it changes completely the way you think about it. Um, but I won't go into great detail because people have um, issues with the idea of complete buildings that we can maybe deal with later. And there's a non-complete building. Um, but there are other things going on in non-complete buildings too. This is um, a piece of work from an artist called Neville Gaby. Gaby was in residence at Cabot Circus in Bristol, my PhD site, for the duration of the construction period of that shopping centre, notionally finishing his residency on its opening day. Thus the work he produced was wholly focused on aspects of the half-built building, and one particular strand of it is worth highlighting here. In Cabot Circus Cantata that this is from, and Canteen, Gaby used songs and recipes re respectively to highlight the individual people from nearly 60 countries who had been present on site during the construction period. In collecting songs and recipes from around the world and performing slash cooking them for wider audiences, Gaby sought to investigate the nature of this transient community. Resident in the city for three years, yet virtually unknown to those outside the boundaries of the development. Three years is as long as most students come to a city for, and they are a group who routinely receive a great deal of attention from local and national politicians, landlords, retailers, and more. Not so the varied workers of a long-term construction site. Perhaps this spectre of non-completion is partially concerned with the subaltern narratives of building. It must be. It's not just the multiple trajectories of the building's half-built states that are written out of their interpretation as they move to the future and become heritage assets. It is also the many individuals who enact or represent those trajectories. It's rarely possible to identify individuals. It is, however, important from a future perspective on the past to at least acknowledge the presence in the past of those anonymous individual humans bound up in the spectre of non-completion. They create the counter narratives to the ideals of the developers and of the city as a whole. So, move away from flowcharts to a table. Okay. Don't say I never give you anything. Here we go. You don't need to read it all, it doesn't matter. Um, during construction, the half-built building belongs to an endless number of different cohabiting trajectories. Each is different. We could take it down to the level of individual perceptions, ultimately. Here it will suffice to broadly locate these trajectories within four future thinking themes. Firstly, we can see in the half-built building the potential for an ideal future. The ideal future is that which is intended by a building's architects, developers, builders and owners, and is the one that will see the building represent what it was intended, what it was intended to represent in perpetuity. Related to this, we have those trajectories that in the present moment relate to future presence, the, the belief that a new building will come to enact a site-specific identity over time. Although this perspective is very close to that of the ideal future, it is much messier and acknowledges more fundamentally the interrelationship of people, buildings and the environment. Whereas an ideal future requires imagining time after now in the context of now, thinking in terms of future presence allows the likelihood that those contexts will be different in later time partially due to the changes in the built environment being enacted in the present. This future is that of the ecologically aware, those taking long-term perspectives on social, environmental and economic sustainability. Third is the uncertain future of which the spectre of non-completion is a part. Here, completion and non-completion are both equally possible. 
but both physically manifested in the half-built building. It's with this step that we can perhaps introduce popular feelings of melancholy, pessimism, excitement, and more ongoing change into what a building means. Lastly, we can discern trajectories related to what I've called the inhabited future. In this form of future thinking, people's intentions to claim or reclaim buildings or built places on behalf of narratives that do not form part of the ideal future are brought to the fore. It is the future as represented by protest in the present or by acts of occupation, both of which explicitly refute certain imposed narratives. I kind of came to this from my work on public art, really. Um, in part, these four different kinds of future thinking relate to the four stages of public art, as described by Mark Hutchinson in a really, really good article um, called The Four Stages of Public Art in Third Text in 2002. Hutchinson sees a four-stage dialectic process that occurs with the creation of any piece of public art. First is non-unity, as a piece of art is placed in a public space. It is an unreflexive position. Second is negation, where the implications of that artwork are realized by people and acted upon. The negation Hutchinson describes is equally of the alienation caused by the artwork, cultural divisions that the work might imply, and the autonomy of art expressed in the artwork's placement. Next stage is totality, where the work exists both as the artist intended and as the public have appropriated it. Finally, totality develops its own agency and changes what public art might be in the future. I don't know if anyone knows this uh, sculpture. Um, it's a particularly extreme example of what can happen to public art with some of these four stages, um, really. It, it's a piece called Forward. It was installed in the center of Birmingham in 1991. Um, there was obviously some kind of non-unity. People didn't really like it, partly because uh, it's big and plastic and orange. But also, didn't, people don't like um, often the the people who paid for art, the locations, what it what it is held to mean. Everything in this case that Hutchinson uh, talks about, and this is how that piece ended up um, in April two thousand and three. That sort of thing doesn't really happen very often. Um, but it's a quite interesting thing to happen to a piece of art. I, 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 as someone who studies public arts quite a lot, um, I'm convinced that art is only interesting when it's being made or when it's being destroyed. Uh, quite extreme example. Now, if we put those two things together, um, we get this. Hutchinson sees those four stages of public art as happening in sequence. It's a highly persuasive argument that they will do so with any building too with perhaps greater visibility, the more prominent the development. Also though, I think these four stages could be seen in any present moment as different potential futures. That is to say that Hutchinson's four stages do not simply happen in turn. They've been happening concurrently all along, and it's merely the ability or need for each to be widely expressed that happens sequentially. If these have all been happening together, then there is some level of equality between them or at least they're all interconnected and cannot be realized in isolation. Realizing this, it becomes less and less acceptable to create meaning around built heritage with reference only, or even primarily to that ideal future, the building as intended by its architects and builders. Each of these other perspectives will come to fruition in some form, and all are there together as part of what the half-built building means. Considering the future, time after now, how this multiplicity of potentials, both simultaneous and sequential, is retained within heritage discourse is a prime concern if we are to understand built heritage in ways that do more than the current tendency to privilege the ideal and ignore the dissonant. Well, so here we are again. Um, Flowcharts are based, flowcharts like this one, are based on the idea of a linear progression through a series of known, assumed, or possible stages 
they're not an interpretation. Rather, flowcharts do have some place in highlighting the events, the active past presence, I guess it depends which way you're looking at the chart from, doesn't it? That form what a building has become by the time we approach it. Within any theoretical flowchart, which this is, we see the, the whole potential life of a building. Of course, with any actual building, if we have things going on in different directions, one chain of things will happen, others will not. But we're able to appreciate some kind of wider context of precarity. There's different potential futures that hover around at any point at which we start our analysis and interpretation of an actual structure. But we also see something else, I think. Something about the very nature of linearity. Often the concept of linear time is directly contrasted with non-linear concepts. It's certainly a criticism of some of my work that it's very firmly focused on contemporary Western planning contexts. It's not necessarily something that would translate well to different cultural contexts. However, I think, I think that thinking about flowcharts can critique linear time without necessarily seeking to replace it with something else. Firstly, um, what flowcharts can do is show us that every event in the process of a building's existence is only one of a number of possibilities. Further, and we see this hopefully in the examples I've shown from a couple of contemporary planning and construction uh, sites, there are also moments when the time and processes remain linear but the flow stops. When it doesn't stop, it speeds up and slows down in relation to wider contexts. Thus, we see that the Lakota is hugely important and divisive for a few months in 2008, not so much afterwards. Under the Hutchinson model and those alternative futures, all sorts of different things can happen, maybe together, maybe in turn. In short, we can see that linear time comes on in fits and starts. It's messy. Sometimes it's very single minded. and Sometimes there are lots of different things traveling together, all intertwined. Looking to buildings we don't know as well, historic buildings, for instance, in their pasts, not, not now. We cannot add much detail to the branches of the flowchart. We might not be able to fully understand the ways in which past time stuttered, trickled or gushed towards the present day. But we can be sure that those wider contexts and precarious events did happen. And with that certainty, we can add uncertainty to how we interpret buildings as archaeological or heritage objects. <coughs> All this means, of course, is that we have a differently nuanced understanding to add to every building of every time in every place. No small task. But we can begin with an, an acknowledgement of these phenomena and their importance. It's a perspective that I think could become a regular part of analysis and interpretation in formalized archaeological and heritage contexts, as consideration of these issues brings with it a whole series of suppressed narratives and, pe and suppressed people and enacted material networks, which will be of interest beyond academic debate and of practical use to anyone who wants to build new things in better ways or oppose things when they think they're being done wrong. We live surrounded by buildings which have been designated as heritage assets and many more that have not been. Many of those buildings that are not yet formally recognised as heritage assets will come to be in the future, whether through as yet unrecognised significance of values they already hold, through associations and actions that have not yet been enacted, or perhaps through mere longevity. If, if the perspective I'm taking here is as important as it appears, I should say as important as I hope it appears, Going some way to represent the agglomeration of unofficial narratives surrounding a building as it moves between past and future and between virtual and physical forms. It's surely right that we work to ensure that what from the present moment becomes heritage in the future reflects it. This is not to say, perhaps, 
that heritage assemblages ought always to represent uncertainty, merely that uncertainty is a constant reality of daily life and that to ignore it in the ways we often do, embodied as they are in legislation and disciplinary traditions, does a great disservice to the majority of our fellow citizens for whom the conscious evocation of uncertainty is a tool for survival. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you. Sorry about all the reading. <laughs> um, uh, very interesting and maybe unexpected uh, uh, take on uh, do buildings flow. So I'll turn it over um, to the crowd uh, for questions. Uh, does anybody want to get off first? Yes. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, I really like what you said about the we can critique linear time without necessarily having to come up with a complete replacement. And it, it got me thinking about uh, um, Kant, if you forgive me here, it could be even more potentially boring than flowcharts. But <laughs> this whole idea of a priori notions, and of course you go off about tangents and the whole idea of the philosophy of something existing and is it going to exist, yeah, yeah, and so yeah. on and so on. Yeah. But that, that was more of a comment, but that led me to the idea of Kant's ideas of aesthetics, because when you talked about your work on public art, I was interested in how you distinguish between buildings and public art, if at all, and how that might reflect on your ideas about how far back in time we can use this, I think would be very helpful. Um, I think in one way I don't distinguish um, at all, partly because I work in contemporary heritage context, and listing doesn't distinguish, really, um, at least something, a listed building can be a piece of public art or it could be a gravestone, or it could be a house. Um, it, in another way, I distinguish a lot because there are very, very different contexts that go into the creation of a building and a piece of public art that, that I think need to be looked at in, in different ways. When I was doing my PhD work on public art, I, um, I actually intentionally um, avoided aesthetics because it's something that I saw as a a bit of a problem with a lot of work that um, had happened before on public art, really. Um, what I started by doing was um, was to research and look at the history of the use of the term public art, um, sort of as my um, as my alternative to thinking about aesthetics and some of the more artistic ways of looking at public art. Um, so, um, yeah, um, I think there are lots of very, very interesting ways of looking at art in itself. There are also um, plenty of ways that it's the same as buildings. I'm not really answering your question, I'm just yabbering on about building, uh, art, but yeah. Thank you. If there's a, if there's a follow-up question that I can clarify. <laughs> and I can, I can try and make it make more sense, sorry. Made my brain hurt. Um, <laughs> uh, so two points, I think. I guess I'll make one one point to come back to James point, but um, that that point seems to resonate quite a lot with Ingold's um, uh, uh, dwelling theory around buildings. That you know, are buildings thought before they're built, or are they actually um, created and responsive and messy and complex? I think you know, many of us theoretically have a great deal of sympathy for, for not for being unable to let go of the idea that buildings are somehow thought before they're built but actually we encounter that messiness every time we come. My, mine's more of a methodological question. So if we you know if we look at the classic text on buildings archaeology, Morris and um, English Heritage understanding start buildings, our job as buildings archaeologists is to identify the primary phase of a building mm. that um, what Morris calls that simple interrelated logic, which is readily apparent, ha ha ha, um, <laughs> and, and then tell, and tell the story of how it's kind of got, you know, um, how it's changed since then. But, but that's what we're doing, we're looking for that moment. And if what you're saying is right, and I haven't really thought through the true implications of what you're saying, that, that, is, that is prompting us to write in quite different ways from the kind of we unpick chronologically backwards in our in our archaeological endeavours, but we tell the story of the building from construction to completion, and it's and it's making us think about reversing that story and completing that story. And I'm not quite sure what that looks like as a building's report. Um, yeah, <laughs> but I'm sure that that is something commercially 
interested in? Yeah, um, it's it it's a real problem for a lot of reasons. I mean, we we've as you know very well have spent generations working in the way we're working with you know plenty of really interesting innovations just within within that. Um, I think what I'm saying is that when I when I look at buildings in the way at the time I approach them, um, either being built as part of the construct as part of the construction process, um, I see things happening to buildings and around buildings that I don't see in buildings reports. Um, that might be uh, obvious, I guess. Um, so, so, so there's definitely, I think, some other nuance or twist to interpretation of buildings. Um, how that feeds into practical recording, mm. especially in a mitigation context where you've got a very, very small amount of time and you're probably being paid by someone who wants to know about the original form and the, mm. and the phases. I mean, I mean, I think with... Is there something around the narrative that, you know, when we see when we see buildings that have changed, that some, something has changed in the design, so you're half built building where something could have gone one way, you know, chapped house at your minster, let's have some masonry bolts, oops, no, let's, not, let's have uh, the timber bolts. So actually, in some ways, we tell that as a kind of narrative of ever improving technological engineering knowledge and, uh, or a mistake that's, and, and there's a different way of telling that story as, as an alternative future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it. it um, I think it would be quite um, impractical, really, for me to suggest that we should take this entire physical and ephemeral potential and actual futures and past of a building and incorporate that into everything that we write about that building, um, especially when we're looking at historic buildings, where that stuff is um, so much harder to come by. Um, I think where I have the slightly more useful conversations with people is when I talk about um, what happens if you, without the facts of all of those moments of uncertainty and different potential futures in the past, if you just assume that they did exist at certain points um, and kind of present a, um, a history of your building that's perhaps perhaps less less certain than it might appear from the fact of certain things still existing now. I think you know, uh, um, as I've said, uh, all of those things that exist have at various points had extremely real potential to not, um, and that just sort of interests me. I mean, it, it it's all very much ongoing work. It would be great to have a go at trying to fit this into into actual reports or even on-site recording. Um, you never know. Um, but I think in terms of something like domestic buildings, you often get clues to that potential future. They, so they might not have the ability to remodel the house entirely, but they might put a new cornice in or they might put a little... So you'll get, I think particularly in something like a domestic building, you'll get that ongoing narrative where you see some of that potential, you see some of that aspiration, you see how that changes over the centuries and what they might want to do to a house and you get little bits of clues here and there. So I think depending, it's going to be different for different sorts of buildings, I think, and, you know, what can get out of it. I think so, yeah. I mean, um, I think I would also say, having worked on two, that you can see it in um, breweries as well. I've never seen a building that represents ongoing innovation and change with quite the regularity that I <laughs> have seen in breweries. It's, I mean, it's a constant drive to be making new stuff in bigger amounts or smaller amounts of wider varieties. It is absolutely constant. So yeah, uh, um, plenty of those things work or don't. And I think in some of those cases, it's more visible. Yeah. Um, I, I just have kind of a, a comment maybe. So this, this really got me thinking um, quite a bit. And um, especially your, your, the last two points that you had up on your slide, buildings incorporate uh, many linear processes, but the overall life of a building stops and starts and is punctuated by moments of uncertainty. And then linear, uh, linearity does not necessarily imply flow. And um, it brought up something, a concept that I've read about in 
gender studies actually about um, differences um, in male and female perceptions of time and um, females tend to perceive things more um, in a spiral starting at one point going around it in a, in a different process ending up at the same point um, but with a different perspective and I was wondering if that was sort of if, if, lin if linearity doesn't um, doesn't necessarily imply flow is there some other way that um, that we could sort of target flow by looking at those moments of, pun of punctuation that you were mentioning yeah um, I, I guess that might well be. I'd, be. I'd be really interested in some references so I can go and read about it. <laughs> that's, uh, uh, it's not something I've read about, so I would really like to. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'm not really very well placed to, to answer that question, but certainly, um, yeah. I would be very, very interested in, it, it just, in it, being able to answer your question. Yeah, it's so, just that uh, this is sort of broken open so many different ideas. And, yeah, yeah. And it just seems like a very applicable for lots of different things to um, to sort of see how it um, impacts it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was really intrigued by your great talk. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, I was really intrigued by your mention of the site hut because um, I think about um, buildings built to build buildings. So there's this, yep. the buildings to build buildings, build, build, build buildings, and then there's the buildings <laughs> built to unbuild buildings, or demolish buildings. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of wondering, um, how does, would that, <laughs> how would that actually, do you feel like those two things are entwined? Do they sit alongside each other? Are they, um, is there a point where they could actually rupture and go sort of their own way? Like, I'm obviously thinking about the work I've done on dig houses, and, and specifically at Chateau Hig, where they had a chicken shed that, um, they built to build the building, and then yeah. it kept on living on, and then it was demolished independently of the building. Um, I just wonder, like, how do those? Do you see those things fitting together? Is one parasitical on one, or? Yeah, I mean, this is um, where this all gets blown open. Is when you look at more than one building. Is it? A, okay. um, is it <laughs> it's a, a a sort of. Um, theoretical approach derived from individual buildings, when you start to look at whole built landscapes, in one way it becomes more complicated, but in another way it seems to make more sense because you, because things are already more complicated by having different buildings, I think that opens you to being able to move away from simple ideas of phasing or even simple interpretation, I think. I mean, that's, that's something I see every day at work when I'm trying to clients um, you know that have individual buildings that they have ideas about but I've got to think about them in terms of the buildings next door and that's differently to the conservation area or the, or the conservation area down the road or the World Heritage Site and it um, yeah I mean I'm always up for complicating stuff <laughs> so, so if you want to make any plans to complicate things let's do it. <laughs> Hi, um, yeah, I really enjoyed it as well. Um, the one thing that I uh, suddenly would like to bring was when you talked about drawing, doodling the flowchart in on January twentieth last year. Yes. Um, it occurred to me that I've noticed a few other archaeologists that I've been hanging out with. They also seem to doodle flowcharts quite a lot in everyday situations. And it got me thinking about how I organise my um, my own time, and, and I do lots of lists and mind maps and stuff. I, I just wondered if you know how many um, people in your initial discussion said that yes, I also draw flowcharts. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, but it's an interesting thing because I mean, um, obviously, if I'd done the version that had lots of different kinds of flowchart in, there are all those other different ways of ordering time that people use very, very regularly. So the most obvious one being a matrix. And, and there are ways that you could turn the building into a matrix if you wanted, if you thought it might be useful. Um, it would be useful and not useful in different ways. But there's also, um, I had to go at uh, sketching something very similar out from the idea of a building down as a kind of um, family tree too um, with ideas of um, whether you could show 
different ways of thinking about a building, imagining them as DNA almost and seeing which strands they remain in. So like the different stages of the building being the strands? Yeah, or the, yeah, yeah the, okay. the different generations. Yeah. So then you, you would end up with um, sort of things that are... So a, a conservatory would be like a cousin. <laughs> it could it could be i mean i guess i mean more that um that that after a few generations in this tree you would have um say a building that was um the theoretical building that was uh half finished and has then become a ruin and is now being um turned into a luxury holiday development like is happening in the Baltic at the moment with the cousin, German, yeah. and that's the same. That's the same generation as the building having been finished and now being used as um, offices, that's kind as of was intended. Yeah. Those two things have no direct relation; they might not know each other, but um, they've sort of happened with the same number of steps behind. See, see, this is what happens when you start thinking about flowcharts, <laughs> um, and you should be. Happy you didn't get that paper. <laughs> <laughs> Just a very quick point, I think it might add on from the comment about um, different perspectives on time and, and, and gender studies, but presumably a lot of the annoying people on Facebook pointed this out when looking at, as opposed to a linear version of time, I work a lot in indigenous studies, so of course until about 10,000 years ago, when of course when people started building things as opposed to art, um, linear time, the, the, the concept of linear time existed in a very different way. The much more common was a more cyclical version of time. So I just I thought it might be useful to look at that if you haven't learned already because of the idea of a matrix. And the, to me, it's interesting that the, the building and the concept of linear time happened at approximately the same point in human history. Mm. Okay, that might be getting a bit too philosophical. No, no, it's it, um, it's that, that's exactly why I, I always keep making the point that. Um, that I'm very much working within a contemporary Western planning context. Yeah. Um, it's not it, um, the the forthcoming book that's got my chapter about um, half-built buildings has also got a chapter by um, Alfredo Gonzalez Rubal about mm -hmm. folk architecture, for instance. Um, and we've been having a bit of a chat about the differences in the ways that you look at time between those different types of building. So, yeah, I, I, I'm very much coming from um, London in 2016, and consciously so, and very aware that the way I'm looking at buildings doesn't necessarily apply anywhere else. I mean, I'm not even sure it applies to history yet. <laughs> but you know, that, that was the question going there I was going to ask yeah. you. <laughs> Is, okay, as you were speaking and you were showing the evidence and your flow of charts, I was thinking, have you? Can you apply it in a prehistoric context, or and how how can how do these things interrelate, or you know, have you been thinking about it? Uh, yes, a lot. Yeah. Um, I have no no answers beyond the one I just gave. <laughs> that, 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 that I, that I, I don't um, I haven't haven't had a chance to work through case studies yet, but I've been um, reading a lot about different kind, different ideas of architecture in prehistory and in places outside Western planning. Um, and it's really interesting, and I hope to continue. Um, and I had another, not question, but a, a, a request for you to tell us a bit about some of the other projects. Um, for instance, one we were talking about earlier with respect to public space, because oh, one, yeah, okay. one of the yeah, things yeah, yeah. that um, I find most fascinating about uh, Jim's work is he from the outside perspective, I think that you're often working at those spaces that aren't typically documented. So at the space between the boxes on the flow chart, and it struck me that some of the work that you've been doing on public understanding public spaces were flowing <laughs> along a similar a similar line. Um, and I wondered if you might um, connect what you've been talking about here with some of the public oriented work that you've been doing. Yeah, um, that work on public space, um, I think it was in sep September 2013. I took part in a project called um, People Sit, where they want to sit? People Sit 
where there are places to sit. That was it. People tend to sit where there are places to sit. Um, it was a long project, but I took part in a public discussion event, literally in the street in in Cricklewood with a microphone, um, cars beeping as they went past and everything. It was, it was great. Um, the idea of this event was there were there was an archaeologist, um, a geographer, an architect, and somebody from a local authority. Um, there's no public space in Cricklewood. Um, how can we come together and get public space? Uh, but being a rather contrary sort of archaeologist, I tried to prove them wrong before I started. Um, so I went down a few hours before the event started and I looked around um, Cricklewood and found all sorts of different public spaces. Um, there was, for instance, on the end of um, a terrace of houses, maybe uh, about a meter up and about 60 centimeters wide, um, a band of uh, names scratched in. Hardly any above, hardly any below. Now I was only there for maybe 10 minutes, but it seemed that that could possibly be, because of the height, um, something to do with kids of a certain age, possibly where the oldest kids from the local primary school hang out, or the youngest kids from the high school, you know, something like that. It's about that height, anyway. Um, but there were also, um, there's the bank outside B&Q where people stand and wait for people to come from the station because it's a really good view when you get up high. Um, there were homeless sites around. Uh, I collected four or five different kinds of public um, space or potential public space around Cricklewood um, High Street and went along then to this um, discussion event uh, with the perspective that if you have a centrally defined notion of public space, then Cricklewood doesn't have any. But if you go and look at what people do in Cricklewood, you can see places that are very definitely public spaces, but critically, um, different sorts of public space to what you might imagine. So those sites I found suggest that there are useful public spaces, useful in that they are used and occupied. Um, there are useful public spaces that aren't accessible to everybody. And there are useful public spaces that um, aren't open for use all the time, for instance. Both of those things go completely against what most, most planners would say are the two central characteristics of good public space. Um, I think that works as a, a nice example of using um, a, a certain type of archaeological analysis of a contemporary environment to redefine some of the central notions of planning, I think in a really useful way, hopefully. Because if people in that area did start to think of these places as, as public spaces, then you're allowing people to do things that they're already doing. Um, I'm not expecting them to do something that you want them to, which is usually to go to a sort of slightly grey looking large public space and be able to walk through it whenever they want. What? <laughs> yeah, that was that was that project. Any last questions for Jim? I think you gave us loads to think about, and I think you are going to go away with loads to think about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for uh, joining us. There's wine at the back of the room, so please finish it. Up. I think we'll head to the pub.